I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, I love it. Welcome to City Bakes. This time on City Bakes, I discover a hidden gem of a baking city. A place I knew nothing about, but where I find that everything I love is at the highest quality imaginable. Proper chocolate. I uncover some historic bakes. It's fantastic. And I go behind the scenes of the world famous diamond industry. Oh, I can see it, yeah. I try traditional dishes with a Michelin star twist. These look like pan au chocolat. No. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I show you how to bake my chocolate layer cake. You have the waffle mixture and you have the Belgian chocolate on the top. Welcome to City Bakes in Antwerp. The classic way for travellers to come into Antwerp is by train. What an incredible way to arrive. This is the prettiest station I think I've ever been to. Antwerp station actually is over 400 metres in length from the beginning over there right to the end. And every single square metre is decorated. So this is the first thing you see when you arrive in Antwerp. Statement piece, isn't it? If this is their station, I wonder what their baking will be like. I can't believe I've never even been to Belgium before. They've created some of my favorite foods here. It's one of the top foodie destinations in Europe. So I want to find out why it produces some of the best products and what makes them so special. My first port of call isn't going to be a bake, but they are one of the most popular things here to eat, chips. You can't come to Belgium without trying the Belgian frit, or to you and me, chips. Now, they were made famous here in the 1700s. This is where the chip was invented. We know them as the French fry, but that is wrong. It's the Belgian fry. For a country of just 10 million people, there are more than 5,000 frit stores like this one. Uh, could I have some frits, please? Small portion? Make it a big one, please. Okay. Thank you. Chips. American soldiers came here in World War I, and because the Belgian people were speaking French, they call it the French fry. So that was the problem. Can you imagine a whole nation being upset? Because actually, it's the Belgian fry, not the French fry. They don't normally put vinegar on the chips. You serve it with a sauce. It's all about the sauces here. It's dead posh. I've asked for curry sauce, simple mayo, and a retro cocktail. The cocktail one I don't like. I don't know, it's too bitter. Curry one's quite nice. But there's more to Antwerp than its fantastic frites. The city is dwarfed by its port. It's the second biggest in Europe and dates back to the Middle Ages. Today, it's the size of nearly 20,000 football pitches. Antwerp was a very industrial city. The Spanish who conquered Belgium were on little trots down to South America, bringing back the cacao beans, bringing back coffee, and ultimately, sugar. Where you have trade, you have money. This became a very, very wealthy city. You can see this in the stunning architecture, but I wonder if you can see the wealth reflected in their bakes. I've arranged to meet food writer Luke Horney. He reviews and researches Antwerp gastronomy. Luke. Oh, nice to meet you, buddy. 
One of his favourite places is Goosen's, the oldest bakery in Antwerp. The history of a city for me lies in two things, pubs and bakeries. <laughs> Man after my own heart. Yeah, and since it's too early to go to a pub, yeah. bakery's a second choice. Baking's always my first choice. I tell you what, it's crowded, isn't it? It's always crowded. This place is always crowded. That's a good sign, no? It is a good sign. It means that the stuff in here is pretty good. This delightful place has been in the same family since 1884. Along with their more modern European bakes, there are a few unusual ones I've never seen before. One of the things here that they do is an Alcazar, which is in fact an ancient recipe based on French pan and, and pineapple. In those days, it was quite a, quite a thing to get pineapples over here. So this is due to the port and all the all the trade that was going on. You've got pastry. Yeah. It could be a jam, and it looks like Franchi pan. It's African. Jam, yeah. and then you have pineapples yeah. in there as well. This is, this is a pastry which has been made for centuries. Mm. It's delicious, though. The almonds in there, the Franchi pan is fantastic. I like that a lot. It was destined for the rich mm. at that day to show off. And there's another fancy loaf that's caught my eye. What is this? A rojo for dumeke. The little, little translation is bread for the damned, because people who were damned or who were poor, they got slices of this from the rich. But you're going you're gonna to order one of those breads. Right. It's called a rojo for dumeke. Say that Let's, again? A, a rojo for dumeke. Can I order a rofa for dukenen? Well, I think you mean this. <laughs> That's the one, yeah. <laughs> you, he you speaks well. English. He's yeah. absolutely fine. In the 17th century, the wealthy were so rich, they could afford to give away expensive loaves like this one. OK, so that's a cross-section of it. See all the raisins in it. That tight structure is a real indication that it's a rye bread. Oh. When you've got raisins in a loaf like that, the flavour and the moisture that it carries to the bread is fantastic. It's a great loaf. Mm. I'd have that every day taste with a little bit of butter. Now, what's this one? This, this, is, is, this is even richer. It um, contains more yeast, it's lighter. Oh, yeah. But it's full of candied fruit. Candy, again, that's candied showing fruit. off money. And this is called... Uh, Sukha. Yeah. Sukha. Tender, suckable. It's like a panettone meets a brioche. No. That's what it's like. It's got really soft dough. The flavour of the citrus comes through. It's rich, it's sugary but it's also got a little bit of a bite to it as well, that little bit of bitterness that comes from the, the fruit, the citrus in there. There's nothing cheap in that. No. The celebration breads that are from Antwerp, they're the ones that are expensive. They're the ones that have got huge amounts of butter in, huge amounts of eggs, huge amounts of fruit. That is a massive indication that there was a lot of money here. Anybody from outside Belgium came here, looked at them and went, wow. People who live in Antwerp, who are born and, born and raised in Antwerp, we adore our city, we love our city. Mm -hmm. And people who are not from the city sometimes consider that as showing off. But we're just very proud of what we are and, and where we come from. Oh, boy, I get a strong feeling that this might be a city I'm going to enjoy exploring. One of the country's most famous products is, of course, the chocolate. Now, I've been baking with Belgian chocolate for years. So why this connection with chocolate and Belgium? And Belgian chocolate rolls off the tongue, but where did that come from? You want to see Antwerp in the 17th century, one of the richest cities. 40% uh, of the European economy went through this city. Mm -hmm. And cacao beans was one of their major products to, 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 to sell. So we tried, we made a drink out of it. Hot chocolate was a drink of choice for the wealthy, who were trying to impress their friends. Cafes all over the city still make it fresh every morning. Oh, that flavour is... It's very Moorish. It's got a nice consistency to it, nice and thick, proper chocolate. It is. And this thing made chocolate famous. But how did this drinking chocolate then move into the bars of chocolate that we know now? There, there we, we needed some help. That help was a very clever Dutchman, Conrad Johannes van Houten. In 1828, he made a discovery. But then he invented the machine which could, like, crush the cacao beans 
and get out the, the butter and leave the powder. Because then we had solid matter, in fact, to make, to turn this drink into a chocolate bar, into something solid. The next big step in chocolate production was the filled chocolate. And if we look here, this guy invented it. This guy? Yeah, this guy is the called house. Nohash. So you know the small yeah, bite-sized things filled with ganache, filled with yeah. whatever. John Newhaus got the idea for the filled chocolate from his pharmacist grandfather, who had covered his medicines in chocolate to make them palatable. This is the heart of something we all take for granted. That box of chocolates we get for Christmas is all down to him. So okay. let's, let's, tr let's try some. My first experience of a Belgian chocolate shop. Bring it on. So here we are really at the beginning of Belgian chocolates. This guy invented it in 1912. This is a praline he made for the World Exposition in 1958, wow. which is still unchanged since yeah. then. So let's try that. The Belgians even have a certain way to actually eat chocolate. Okay. If, you, if you taste the chocolate, you must I mean you really yes. to appreciate the, the filling. So bite half of it like this. Mm -hmm. So get all the layers together. It tastes amazing. It's quite chewy as well. Yeah. It's probably rude just to try one. I particularly like white chocolate. So. Thank you very much. It's a very nice one. Now this. Enjoy it, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Now the thing is about these are filled chocolates. This is the thing that made the difference. Yeah. Once the praline went inside, or the ganache, yeah. then that was owned by yeah. this guy that started yeah, the, he's, chocolate, yeah, yeah. the chocolate movement. Yeah, correct. He actually changed how the world looks at chocolate. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. The original filled chocolate. Another reason to adore Antwerp. But it's not just chocolate they do exceptionally well. Luke's pointed me in a direction of a chef who's known for his unique bake. This restaurant has held a Michelin star for over 30 years. And the chef, Johan Segers, produces some of the best food in Antwerp. Here at Tifornis, Johan takes traditional Belgian dishes and transforms them into extraordinary plates of food. But it's his famous bake I want to see. These look like pan au chocolat. No, whoa, 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 that's a big difference. <laughs> there certainly is. These are, believe it or not, Michelin starred sausage rolls. Why are you making sausage rolls in a Michelin star yes, restaurant? I have a better name Worstenbrot. Yeah, that's, Worstenbrot. that's, that's Flemish, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Worstenbrot wasn't always served in a fancy restaurant. Its roots go back to the 1920s, when Antwerp's dock workers used to get drunk in the bars. The owners would give them free sausage rolls to sober them up so they could keep spending their money on drink. It's a bar snack. <laughs> there you have it. Yeah. Antwerp bar snack. Sausage roll. Yeah. Can I try one on, please? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. They smell amazing. Yeah. So what's yeah. in these? What have you got? That's a mix from veal and pork. It's beautifully crispy on the outside. Mm -hmm. Soft and buttery on the inside. The dog I eat. OK. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you go yeah. ahead. Pastry yeah. is more like a bread. Yeah. Yeah. It's very light. It is. It's like a brioche crispy, almost. Crispy. A mm. little bit. But inside, you have this gorgeous pork and veal that runs all the way through it. That's very, very good. My dad made sausage rolls in his bakery when I grew up, but Scouse ones were never this posh. I'm intrigued to find out how Johan makes his. So, that's the meat. This is, this is very top end. So you have good quality pork yeah. and good quality veal. Yeah, absolutely. For, that's, for me, very important. Yes. What we do, we put it three eggs inside. Three? Okay. Yeah. A little bit of milk. A little bit of milk, OK. Breadcrumb. Breadcorn, bread also inside. That's quite that normal. Make it well. a little bit light. Yes. Bit of seasoning. That's uh, with taste. A little bit more pepper. You taste the raw meat. Absolutely. Really? Raw. Each to their own. It's not even mixed. The filling is combined, then it's wrapped in a sweet, butter enriched dough and left to prove. I've never seen um, a sausage roll made with a croissant dough before, so that, that is different to me. Yeah, that's a, a specialty, eh? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's the oh, food of the oh. common man, but this yeah. is the posh yeah. version. OK, <laughs> that's um, time. 
then it's into the oven for 15 minutes. Sausage roll is such a basic thing, but what Johan's done is given it the Michelin star effect and created something that is simply divine. I'm exploring Antwerp, and I'm heading away from the city centre to the old Jewish district. This community has been here for over 800 years, and many of the Jewish people work in Antwerp's famous diamond industry. Now, I've heard just around the corner is the Del Rey Patisserie, where Bernard Prout produces some of the finest cakes in the city. Me, pastries. Oh, yes. Lovely to meet you. I'm Paul. Nice to meet you. Now, looking down here, they're beautiful. It's bavoise, it's mousses, it's brulees. Bernard has created over 30 designs which change seasonally. And getting this level of precise finish on each one is a testament to his perfectionist character. Each cake is like a little diamond. What you've got here is absolutely stunning. How long have you been doing this? I'm here already for more than 30 years. Quite a long time. Wow. Quality baking like this takes time and doesn't come cheap. But Bernard has customers who can afford the best. We have the locals, we have the Jewish community, we have also the international public from the diamonds. Business is just in our back. Every cake is made in the bakery beneath the shop. This is where it all happens then? Yes. And it looks like he's got all manner of gadgets to make his fancy cakes, including a spray gun. Yes. So you've got on a compressor as well? Yes. Like in a garage. <laughs> you have as well. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. probably with your tires. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. It's like being in Willy Wonka's factory and then some... I mean, a compressor with a spray gun. So we're basically going to spray a car now in a booth, but we're going to spray a cake instead. Bernard's decorating one of his most popular cakes, the vanilla and passion fruit bavoir. He's spraying raspberry chocolate on a butterfly stencil. His attention to detail is incredible. Okay. You see? Yeah. You want to do it? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's easy, yeah? If you fancy doing this at home, I suggest you take your cake to the local garage. I need one of these in my life. Oh! Yes. It's too much on there, isn't it? Right. Sorry, I messed up. No problem. <laughs> I went to art school too. Clearly not up to scratch, but I better leave it to the expert. For extra wow factor, Bernard creates a 3D effect using tempered chocolate. When the chocolate is temperated, we put it on the transfer. Mm -hmm. we, it's like you have this one, but then yeah. the other side. This isn't just a cake, it's a work of art. And then we put... Uh, You put it like that, and so we have the 3D. But the idea of spray painting and giving it a 3D effect with the tempered chocolate on the outside, the raspberry holding it up, it's so delicate and beautiful that when you look at it as a whole cake, it is absolutely divine. Thanks, Chef. Your kitchen is amazing, by the way. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. There are more treasures just around the corner because Antwerp's Diamond District is right on his doorstep. So I'm hooking up with Lisbeth Morellis, an official from the diamond industry here in Antwerp. You're in a diamond square mile, but don't be mistaken, it's not all glitter and glamour here as you can see because it's business to business. I did expect it to be a little bit more... Fancy, yeah. you can see it. This whole area is completely dedicated to diamonds. 84% of every rough diamond passes through Antwerp. Wow. We have the labs to certify the diamonds. We will sort the diamonds because every type of company needs to know what type of diamond they need. Diamonds have been trading here for 500 years and the city turns over an incredible, wait for it, $57 billion a year. Have to go to security. Elizabeth has agreed to take me behind the scenes to show me where the really big deals take place. This is the Bourse, where traditionally 
trade is buy and sell. It's not quite what I was expecting a trading floor to look like. Everything is based on trust. If we have a deal, we say mazalu bracha, may mazalu, this, bracha. mazalu bracha, may this deal bring you good luck. When we've shaken, the deal stands. There'll be no handshakes from me today, but I'm keen to see some rough diamonds. Trader David has agreed to show me a selection. How can I help you? For me, I'm, I'm fascinated with the whole world of diamonds. Uh, uh, these are not cut diamonds. These are rough diamonds, exactly is that right? Exactly right. So, when you look at that, they don't look very special. Here, I have um, low-quality diamonds. Yeah. But you can see that still, there's life in it. Oh, can there's a mark it? inside yeah, there, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It? You want to check? Please do. You will see it. Oh, I can see it, yeah. So in each stone, you will see it has its own charm. Can you tell a vivid colour at, at the rough diamond stage? Of course, yeah. That's all the... This is all the, the business. This is the game that we play. So if I get a, a stone like this one, mm -hmm. and let's say you see it's off color, and another guy sees and he checks it, and he sees, listen, I think I can make a fancy color out of it. And that's the beauty of the rough diamond. Fancy colored diamonds have a natural color caused by the presence of other elements like nitrogen or boron. And the way that the diamond is cut and polished affects the intensity of the colour and therefore the price. So what sort of value do you think you're looking at there in total? The whole value together? Yeah. I don't know, you have a calculator? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but let's say this is 337 carats. Mm -hmm. So the price for this is around $350 per carat. That's nearly $118,000 right there. Incredible. But there's no deal for me today. With my hands firmly in my pockets, it's time to get back to what I know best, food. Whilst I'm in a city, I like to create a bake. And my pal Johan has invited me back to taste the fantastic seasonal stew he has on his menu this time of year. How are you doing, Johan? How are you, Nice to see you, my friend. You're right. As a northerner, I'm partial to a good stew, and I can't wait to collaborate with this Michelin-starred chef and add my twist to his dish. OK, tell me about this. It's a Flemish stew, isn't it, really? Yes, that's carbonate flamande. OK. Um, that's a good meat, onions, beer. Very simple. Well, I'd love yeah. to see the way you do it. OK. First thing I do, that's maybe for you. I need one onion. OK. OK. That's, uh, that's okay for you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so, Chief, that's the meat, the Wagyu beef. Unbelievable. Antwerp pulls it out again. It's Wagyu beef. Wagyu is one of the most expensive beefs you can buy in the world. These are specifically reared and massaged, so you get a fat lining all the way through, and it, the fat is where the flavour is in the meat. Other cuts like shin and brisket will work just fine. <laughs> Johan sautés onions in oil and butter, then seasons the meat before browning in a pan. We need now a nice baked colour. Yeah, yep. you're looking for that the wrong caramel. side. Yeah, yeah. So you've got thyme in there, you've got a bay leaf in there. In goes that amazing wagyu. Just plain flour. Yeah. This is going to thicken the sauce. Yeah, like. yeah, but a little bit. OK. And here's the secret touch. Belgian beer. Rich, dark and full of caramel flavours. At home, I would use stock cues, but of course, Johan makes his own jus. In all the big hotels, five stars, when I was at the Dorchester, my job was skimming the top of the stock. And it's all done with the bones. Yeah. So you have From all the cold. vegetables in it. Yeah, yeah you have all the beef cold. bones in there. Big stock pots like this. Absolutely. And it reduces, 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 and it sets like a jelly. Johan's also adding mustard, but in a way I've never seen before. That's a lot of mustard. The bread will dissolve and help thicken the stew. It's finished. The job is it. finished. The rich Flemish stew <laughs> has been cooked for an hour. This recipe couldn't be any simpler. I can't wait to try it.
it's absolutely drop dead gorgeous there. This is. That's, this is too much. <laughs> yeah. it's, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, yeah, it's yeah. not. <clears throat> With the wagyu, it breaks down, it melts, and the beer with that beautiful beef stew together. That is one of the best stews I've ever had in my life. I love you, chef. <laughs> wow. It's nice, eh? Wow. But I've come round here to bake. The problem I've got now is I want to try and put my little touch to it to make it a little bit different. That's a potato, yeah, I know. But what... Uh... Can you make a couple of chips from that for me, please? Chips? Chips. Yeah. Yep, chips. I've decided to go simple. And you know what? Sometimes that's just enough. It is, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good deal. <laughs> I work and you... Uh... Now, I'm basing this on, like, a Lancashire hot pot. Now, a Lancashire hot pot traditionally has potatoes on top of it. So what I'm going to do is actually layer them onto the top, one layer, and then cross them across the top. So basically, you have your beautiful stew underneath. Yeah. You have... The potatoes on the top, which have been seasoned, it's got a little bit of clarified yeah, butter on it. Yeah. That will have to go back in the oven now. Yeah. The chips should cook on top. Yeah. So we're going to have frits with your beautiful yeah, stew yeah, underneath yeah, yeah. it. Thank you. After 20 minutes in the oven, our Flemish stew collaboration is complete. You eat it together. Right? Oh, yeah. The meat and the chips together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Try this on a cold evening using a quality waxy potato and your leftover stew. It's just perfect. I love the crunch on those mm -hmm. potatoes. That's fantastic with the shows together. These are crispy, lots of flavour, well seasoned, and with that stew underneath. Wow, I think it's delicious. Thank you very much indeed, Chef. No, no, I it. think you. You've got to try this at That's home. Me. Ah, Antwerp, I'm learning to love you. I'm in Antwerp, a small Belgium city that I've discovered is big on surprises. From the best sausage roll I've ever eaten... That's very, very good. ..to incredible frites. Chips. Last night, I dined out on a famous Belgian delicacy, mussels. Look at that for a mussel. But to discover why they taste so amazing in Antwerp, I was told I had to get up early. It's 6 a.m. in the morning, and no, I'm not on my way to a bakery. I'm actually on my way to check out where Antwerp gets all their mool or their mussels, which they're so famous for. Happy days. Mussels are one of my favorite foods, and I'm not alone. Belgians consume 60,000 tons of them a year. The mussels I ate last night were harvested just 30 minutes outside the city, on the border of Belgium and the Netherlands. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Fisherman Martin has agreed to take me out on his ship to collect some. I don't often get out to sea. What a great way to start the day. Same sea, same tidal thing. Yeah. We're heading out to an arm of the North Sea, where most of Belgian mussels come from. What is it about this particular waters that produce the best mussels in the world? Well, it's a combination. You've got, like, very nutritious water. Also, the movement of the tide lets the mussels work, and they have to hold on against the elements, against predators, against everything, and that just makes them uh, sturdy and meatier. They plump up. Yeah, no, they're, they're going to be strong and firm meat. The mussels are grown and harvested further out to sea. Then they're brought closer to shore and stored here. That's actually where we're going now. To pick them up. To pick them up. This area produces a massive 65 million kilos of mussels a year. That's incredible. Huge chainmail nets scoop the living mussels up from the shallow seabed below us. Look over here. 
Look at that. Some mussels. Wow. Right from I the... can almost smell the frit. Yeah. <laughs> They're lovely, you there. Can, you can't get them any fresher than this. No, you can't. They are actually a decent size. They're a nice size mussel. Yeah. Then. Once the mussels are harvested, they go back to the shore to be cleaned, then delivered straight to the restaurant in Antwerp. But I can't wait that long. Nice and clean, though. Perfect, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thankfully, the wheelhouse has somewhere to prepare breakfast. Cheers. Oh, it's a bit warmer in here, isn't it, Mark? So, heat up the stove. So within five minutes of them coming out of the sea, they're in the pot, they're going to be cooked, we're going to eat them. Nice. So, let's look inside. Look at that. Roll open, mm -hmm. so that means they're ready. Oh, they smell lovely. It's the smell of the sea. At 8 o'clock in the morning, it's a mighty sight. Right, should we have a go? Mm. It tastes good, which is really nice good, yeah. saltiness to it. Yeah. And a firm taste. It's plump, it's delicious, and it's a little... A little taste of the sea. They're really, really good. This is the real thing. That is what you call a very special mussel. With a belly full of mussels, it's time I headed back to land. Now, Antwerp is a pretty compact city and fairly easy to get around using the tram. I'm going back to the Jewish neighborhood I was in yesterday to visit one of the city's most popular bakeries. Kleinblatt has been baking bread in Antwerp since the 1920s. It's at the heart of the Jewish community, with third generation baker Henry at the helm. Hello, Henry. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you. This bakery is unlike the ones I grew up with. It adheres strictly to Jewish law, and a rabbi visits daily to ensure everything is certified kosher. So, what do you do then to make sure that the, the rules are followed? Well, it's quite simple. The first thing is the products that are used here. Yeah. There's certain items, well, according to the bab, you must not use, uh, let's say, fat from an animal. Yeah. Then, I have to crack up every, every egg that comes in. I've cracked within millions of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And we have to check that there's no blood inside. Yes. Why no blood? Because for us, in the Bible says a person may not eat blood. Yes. The second part is that Every morning I come in, I bless all the doors that have been done. OK. That's that. With the dough now blessed, we can start making the special holler bread. <sighs> Getting a little word up. Holler is a Jewish plaited loaf that's served traditionally on the Sabbath. It's the centerpiece of the religious Shabbat dinner. As today is Friday, head baker Adolf has to plat 1,500 of these. I reckon I can help. And you want to look first how he does it? Look at the speed. <laughs> I need to have a go at this. Yeah, right. <laughs> This is hard. Push enough, then you have them longer. Yeah. Than How can you learn this in two seconds? <laughs> that is really difficult to do. What the biggest problem is when you're doing this, which I hugely respect him for, is getting them all the same. I could normally do an eight strand plat dead easy, too. That was a bit of a hindrance. But there's some bread just come out the oven. Tasting, I can definitely do. Just freshly baked. Yeah. Mm. It's good. It's good bread. Yeah. It's very good bread. Henry's family have been serving the community for more than eight years. The only time the bakery has had to shut down is during World War II. The Germans came and they took the ovens because they weren't made from messing. Special metal they used to make them tanks. So they took everything out. That is incredible. Yeah. 
that after the war, when they reopened the bakery, many people were without jobs. So my grandmother, she gave them a job. And I hear from people that they had a grandfather working for us and a grandmother working for us. It was quite interesting to see the social impact it had uh, during those days. Yeah. But there's one thing that we see, that is that people have and the nostalgia of the bakery. Yeah. I can appreciate the love that they put into each of their loaves, from the rabbi to the bakers. It's actually quite touching. So I've worked in a lot of bakeries around the world, but I've never worked in a bakery that has a heart. This bakery has a big heart. I'm discovering that Antwerp is rather a hidden gem, and I've just found a baker that makes nothing but thousands of handmade biscuits. Ah, hello. 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 Philip de Court has been making biscuits for 28 years. He's following in the footsteps of this city's biscuit baking tradition. About 150 years ago, there were more than 20 big factories in the center of Antwerp. The people of Antwerp are clearly discerning, demanding 30 varieties with their morning coffee. What makes a good biscuit to you? A good biscuit starts uh, with the right sugar, because it's the sugar which gives the structure on your cookie. I can let you taste the difference. Please. Okay. This one is with a, a, a rougher, a bigger sugar. Yeah, more like a caster sugar yeah. or granulated, yeah. yeah. This is with melt sugar. I boil, boil them a little ah, bit. Ah, okay. Yes, sugar. This man really knows his biscuit baking. You see the difference in the structure? Mm. The big difference for me and that is the melting quality yeah it melts much much quicker with the the one with the caster and this one oh we got more <laughs> i'm going to struggle leaving this shop yeah. and this one for midwinter festivals philip also makes the biggest biscuit i've ever seen i'll break off a little bit of the fluff where's the tea That's nice to put in your coffee. That is a great dunker. The passion that he puts into his biscuits really come through when you actually come to taste it. It's all about the freshness, and believe me, it makes a huge difference. To be honest, every single one of those biscuits tasted unbelievable. You may have spotted one Belgian bake missing from my visit so far. Well, don't worry. Before I leave Antwerp, I'm stopping off for Belgian waffles. Tamara Tomek has invited me to her family's shop, and in the city of waffle shops everywhere, she is sure of her position. I am the best. You want to know? Yes, please. I'll show you. Bizarrely, they don't call them Belgian waffles here. That was the name made up to sell them to the Americans in the 1960s. Here, they're known as the Brussels waffle. I thought I'd come here to taste them, but Tamara has other ideas. So every morning we uh, make the butter. Full fat milk. Yeah. And then you can add 10 eggs, please. 10 eggs? Yeah. Shells and all. No. Thank you. <laughs> I'm adding plain flour, vanilla, salt and yeast to make the batter. You're doing it very well. How much do you pay? You're just learning still. But you can eat waffles. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. I get That's paid like in waffles. Deal. Yeah. I get paid in waffles and beer. Wait until you try them. You're going to be happy that you're going to be paid in waffles. Let's go make waffles, then. OK. Upstairs, all the waffles are made on six gas-fired waffle irons. The waffle is really the best waffle because when you put it in, the heat is coming immediately into the iron and making the waffle uh, crusty on the outside and really soft in the inside. You want to try one? Go on. You do it in the middle and you turn it left. You can do it with the... Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, no. They serve around 500 waffles on a busy day. 
That's some going. It's not as easy as it looks, you know. Oh, no. This one is for me and this one is for you. I'm making the right pig's ear of this one. It's OK, just leave it alone. Leave it alone, get it back in. Or okay, hide here? that one. This one? It's really difficult, I think. Ah, there you go. I think when you're doing this sort of thing, it's about a technique. You want to try one? I should really, shouldn't I? Yeah, you can try yours. Like it? I think it's probably the best waffle I've ever had in my life. I know. It's so light. These are like little clouds, but with the cream as well, blended together. Sorry, I've got to get back to my waffles. It looks amazing. Thank you. you turn it around. What's happened there? You were too slow to turn it. Was that what it was? Uh, Men can't is. do two things at the same time. Sure. <laughs> I'm nearly at the end of my time here in Antwerp, and before I leave, I want to make something that reminds me of the city. So, I've decided to create my own dessert using some of tomorrow's waffle batter mixture. I'm going to show you how to make my indulgent chocolate layer cake. So, to start with, I need the waffle mixture. Can I take some of this yes, of waffle course. mixture? Thank you. This is very similar to a pancake batter, but there's yeast in here for extra rise. So I'm going to add a little bit of sugar to this, and a little bit of sugar to this. I'll also, in one of them, I'm going to add some cocoa powder straight in. This is where your chocolate layers come from. This is an eight-inch tin. All I've done is put a little bit of grease beef down at the bottom, and I'm going to put a layer of batter in here. So take one scoop of the mixture, pour it in, take that down to the side, then stick your tin under the grill for about a minute. Happy with that? So the first layer is in, you've got that browning on the top, which just indicates that this mixture is actually cooked already. The next layer will be a chocolate one. Again, this will give you a great distinction between the white and the chocolate, the white and the chocolate. We're going to do ten layers, five of each. Swirl the mixture evenly around the tin, then it's under the grill again. Lovely. Second layer of chocolate. You can see that it's cooked. See that it's cracked around the side? OK, so that is the chocolate. Keep going like this, building up your alternating layers until you're near the top of your tin. Then let your layer cake cool. Now, I've done the last one, so I'm just going to release the cake, which it now is, and you can see all those beautiful layers. As I'm in Antwerp, a cake can't have enough Belgium chocolate. So this is chocolate. This is basically ganache, so it's equal amount of chocolate to cream. You want a pouring consistency, not too thick, because what we're going to do now is basically pour it over the top of the cake. Carefully cover all the cake with chocolate, making sure it's nice and smooth, then delicately pipe lines of melted white chocolate on top. Then just get the back of a blade and just draw your blade through it one way and then another. And that is the finishing touches to something which actually is a little bit special. This is my indulgent chocolate layer cake. It's light and the smooth chocolate adds richness. What you've got is a celebration of Belgium. You have the waffle mixture and you have the Belgium chocolate on the top. Look at the layers all the way through. I like it, but what does my waffle boss think? Pretty good. Almost as good as my waffle. Ah, those Antwerpians, so sure of themselves. I can't quite believe I have never explored the sensational baking of this quiet little city before. Everything I've encountered here in Antwerp is so simple, but so special. You can see the city's wealth and richness reflected in their amazing food. 
I've tried historical bakes and tasted the best mussels ever. That is what you call a very special mussel. I've met locals that are keeping food traditions alive and seen simple dishes transformed into something quite remarkable. That is one of the best stews I've ever had in my life. <laughs> we brush over Antwerp thinking, oh, it's just a little city in Belgium. It's not. It's a foodie capital. It's the foodie capital, I would say, in Northern Europe. <laughs>